Good morning and welcome to AEI and to AEI Online if you're watching. My name is Paul Kupiak. I'm an AEI resident scholar specializing on banking and financial issues. Today's policy session is the Bank Holding Company Act obsolete is particularly timely. Last week, Zions Bank announced its plans to jettison its bank holding company to free itself from burdensome and costly Federal Reserve Board bank holding company regulations put in place under the Dodd-Frank Act. Zions is only the latest and the largest bank to take this step. Some prominent legal minds think this is just the start of a trend. They think that many banks have a fiduciary responsibility to eliminate the burdensome costs and minimal benefits attached to the bank holding company structure. I am grateful today to welcome recognized experts that have accepted my invitation to discuss this issue at AEI, and I expect we will hear a lively exchange of views on the future of bank holding companies. Let me begin by introducing the moderator for today's session, my friend, former AEI colleague, and moderator extraordinaire, Alex Pollack, who will introduce today's keynote speaker and the policy panelists. Alex J. Pollack is a distinguished senior fellow at R Street Institute. He was president and CEO of the Federal Home Loan Bank of Chicago from 1991 to 2004. He is a recognized authority on financial policy issues, uh, many of them. He is the author of The Boom and Bust, Financial Cycles and Human Prosperity, numerous articles, congressional testimony, and what is perhaps his most consulted work by those who know him, Pollock's Laws of Finance. Please join in welcoming our moderator, Alex Pollock. Thank you. Thank you, Paul, and good morning, all. And it's a pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Keith Noreka, who, as of yesterday, is the first deputy controller of the currency for a day. Until then, he was acting controller of the currency, in which role he was described by the American banker as the ultimate disruptor, a great, a great title. Previously, he was a partner in Simpson, Thatcher, and Bartlett, where he advised and represented a wide range of domestic and international financial institutions. As acting controller, Keith was notable for proposing pro-competitive ideas, which we know he'll continue to do wherever he heads from here. Uh, Keith will speak for about 15 or 17 minutes and has kindly agreed to take a couple of questions after his remarks after his remarks. Thanks so much for being with us today, Keith, and welcome to the AEI podium. Thank you, Alex, and uh, thank you for having me here today. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be at AEI um, this morning. Uh, the mission of the American Enterprise Institute to defend human dignity, expand human potential, and build a freer and safer world resonates with me on a personal level. Uh, I also share AEI's belief that democracy, free enterprise, and American strength and global leadership are paths to achieving those ends. That is why I am so committed personally to reducing unnecessary regulatory burden and promoting economic growth. Before going any further, I want to congratulate our new comptroller, Joseph Otting, on his confirmation and swearing in as the 31st comptroller of the currency yesterday. I know he will be a tremendous success, and he is joining what I think is a top-notch agency full of dedicated professionals. In fact, I share the sentiment of former comptroller Charles Dawes writing to incoming comptroller Lawrence Murray at the turn of the 20th century, quote, I am glad you are going to be comptroller of the currency. It is, with one or two exceptions, the greatest place in Washington. Since Mr. Dawes became vice president, I will forgive his error uh, in thinking that there are any places in Washington that are better to work than the OCC. So this speech is a bit of a unicorn in that I am delivering it as first deputy comptroller of the currency whose resignation from government service is effective at close of business today. It has been my honor and highlight of my career so far to serve as the acting comptroller. 
I think we were able to accomplish a few things during my short tenure, and for the many, many people who helped make those things happen, I am deeply grateful. Serving as acting comptroller reinforced my belief that when running well, the federal banking system is an engine capable of powering economic growth and prosperity for consumers, businesses, <clears throat> and communities across the country. Part of the bank supervisor's job is to find that balance where supervision ensures banks operate in a safe and sound manner, provide customers fair access to financial products and services, and treat those customers fairly. At the same time, regulators strive to eliminate unnecessary regulatory burden and to foster an environment that tolerates prudent risk-taking and encourages banks to focus on meeting the financial and credit needs of their customers. Regulation is a powerful tool to be used judiciously. We need it in moderation to achieve safety and soundness and fair treatment of banks' customers but anything more places a drag on productivity and economic op opportunity. And that's a tax we all pay. Policymakers should strive to avoid it. I also admire AEI for asking big, difficult questions that force us to reevaluate long-held beliefs. Exploring these questions in a dispassionate manner promotes better policy and ensures that the policies we maintain serve the nation's needs of today. Too often, laws and regulations outlive their usefulness and original purpose, but continue to exist because of a reluctance to change and, and an unwillingness to examine how things can be done better. The question you have posed, whether bank holding companies have become obsolete, is one of those big questions that is sure to elicit a strong response and inspire a rich debate. Today's question, whether bank holding companies are obsolete, is a timely one that is being asked in more and more boardrooms each day. It's not a new question. It was widely being discussed prior to the financial crisis as well. Banking companies need ownership structures to be as efficient as possible and serve as sources of strength to their insured depository institutions. Banks of all sizes face pressure to produce returns and compete with more types of companies. Costs, sometimes in the form of regulatory requirements, continue to rise while growth remains modest. There are two levers any business owner can pull to improve performance, reduce costs and gain efficiencies, or increase revenue. If the corporate structure does not produce meaningful benefits for the company in one of these ways, then it is ripe for change. The answer to the question whether bank holding companies are obsolete is not a simple yes or no. A better question may be whether bank holding companies are good, a good idea for all banking companies. Bank holding companies may continue to serve a useful purpose for large, complex companies, especially those seeking to engage in activities abroad, but they may provide less value to simpler, more traditional banking firms. In the next few minutes, I want to share my perspective by discussing how the recent changes in laws and regulation have decreased the value of and increased the cost associated with bank holding companies. The case of Bank of the Ozarks is a good example of why smaller bank holding companies are eliminating their holding companies. Bank of the Ozarks, a state non-member bank, merged its holding company into the bank in June. A month earlier, its proxy statement explained why. The reorganization, quote, would lead to managerial, operational, and administrative cost savings and efficiencies, end quote. Those savings and efficiencies stem from simplified financial reporting, elimination of Federal Reserve oversight, and decreased SEC registration fees. The company claimed additional gains through consolidated governance and organizational structure, policies and procedures, and risk management, as well as removing the duplication of having boards of directors at the bank and holding company levels. Other costs of operating a holding company also add up. While bank holding companies can choose to incorporate in states with relatively progressive corporate laws, they are separate legal entities that become subject to the law of the state in which they are incorporated. As a result, bank holding companies incur separate expenses and state franchise taxes and in some states may not be eligible to file consolidated state tax returns. 
I also suspect that the management of banks, such as Bank of the Ozarks, are keenly aware of the cost and burdens that would be imposed on their organizations once they cross the $50 billion asset threshold, although that may change if a bipartisan proposal shared by Senator Crapo several weeks ago becomes law. These costs that apply to holding companies with more than $50 billion in assets serve as artificial deterrence to growth. Without their holding companies, the behavior of banks approaching that level would be guided by market incentives rather than the distortive and artificial forces of government regulations. For smaller companies where every dollar counts, the savings and efficiencies of doing away with their holding companies can be material. Meanwhile, any loss in value to, company, the, to the company likely will be negligible for a variety of important reasons. Foremost among those reasons is the fact that for most bank holding companies, the bank is where the action is. It usually makes up the vast majority of the company's assets and activities. That was the case with Bank of the Ozarks. Even with the advent of the financial holding company structure and the wider array of activities uh, they can engage in under the Graham Leach Bliley Act, most banking organizations continue to conduct business through their banks and bank subsidiaries. In light of this reality, many community and regional banking organizations are realizing that the extra and duplicative cost of maintaining a holding company make little business and economic sense. With respect to their business activities, banks lose virtually nothing by doing away um, with their holding companies. Over the past several decades, banks have been allowed to do more, while bank holding companies have become more restricted. Originally, the Bank Holding Company Act was intended to restrict geographic expansion of large banking groups and to prevent excessive concentration in commercial banking. The law was created to stop monopolies, and lawmakers had one particular company in mind, Transamerica. The trend since 1956, when the original statute was enacted, has been toward limiting bank holding company activity to financial activity. Over time, defining the activities permissible for bank holding companies has evolved to incorporate a doctrine of separating banking from commerce. As a consequence, bank holding companies have become limited in their ability to own and operate non-financial and non-banking businesses, even though that could make for a more diverse company. Even the expansion of activities permitted under GLEBA in 1999 did not fundamentally alter the direction of limiting non-banking activities <clears throat> because the additional activities it allowed were financial in nature or incidental to financial activities. In addition to these restrictions, the post-crisis framework of the Dodd-Frank Act has added costly prudential requirements. For instance, the law currently subjects companies that exceed $10 billion in assets to stress testing requirements that have been used to raise capital levels at banks and manage systemic risk. The Dodd-Frank Act and the Basel Capital Rules have reduced the flexibility of bank holding companies to issue capital instruments different from those permitted to banks and to downstream capital to their bank and non-bank subsidiaries. While these requirements may make sense for the largest firms and may serve a greater societal purpose, they are applied through the use of a 10 or $50 billion threshold that, in my view, appears arbitrary and poorly calibrated to contain systemic risk. The Fed itself seems to share that view. Given the interconnectivity among the largest firms and the broader financial market, regulation of the holding company might appear to be a convenient way to help manage systemic risk. The holding company structure, however, is not a necessary tool for addressing systemic risk. Enhanced prudential supervision and regulation can readily work with the universal banking structure, as it has in countries like Canada, Australia, and Germany. Some research even suggests that the diversification that comes with universal banking played an important role in helping the banking systems in countries like Canada and Australia better withstand the most recent financial crisis. If the holding company is not necessary as a tool to manage systemic risk for the largest firms, then it has even less of a place with respect to the small and mid-sized firms that do not present systemic risks. In fact, as I discussed in my testimony before Congress in June, 
the imposition of increasingly onerous regulations on holding companies based on arbitrary asset thresholds following the financial crisis has erected competitive barriers that benefit the largest firms to the detriment of smaller ones. My testimony before the Senate Banking Committee discussed the inefficiencies presented by bank holding companies and offered several suggestions that would reduce the disadvantages of maintaining a holding company and make it easier to operate without one. Congress could reduce regulatory redundancy in, situation, in this situation by amending the Bank Holding Company Act to provide that when a depository institution constitutes a substantial portion of its holding company assets, say 90%, the regulator of the depository institution would have sole examination and enforcement authority for both the holding company and the depository institution. This change would eliminate supervisory duplication and its inherent inefficiencies, freeing resources to meet the needs of banks, customers, and communities. It could be limited to holding companies of a certain asset size. At the same time, banking law would continue to recognize that it is appropriate to have a separate regulator for large companies that conduct complex activities, including securities and derivatives businesses, while at the same time conducting consumer and commercial banking. The proposed change simply would extend to smaller banking organizations the benefits of having a single federal regulator at both the bank and holding company levels, a benefit that state banks that are members of the Federal Reserve System and their holding company already enjoy. Another approach to the problem of multiple regulators would be to eliminate statutory impediments for firms that want to operate without a holding company. Congress could modernize the corporate governance requirements for national banks by allowing them to adopt fully the governance procedures of, for example, the state in which their main office is located, Delaware General Corporation Law, or the Model Business Corporation Act. This change would put banks on the same footing as bank holding companies and benefit banks that wish to operate and access the capital markets without a holding company. Of course, even without congressional action, companies like Bank of the Ozarks are fixing the problem on their own by merging their holding company into the bank and dispensing with the additional costs, complexities, legal liabilities, and corporate inefficiencies. In doing so, companies obviously should consider carefully all of the business implications of operating without a bank holding company, but ultimately companies like Bank of the Ozarks will have the final word on whether bank holding companies are obsolete. I want to allow ample time to answer your questions, but before closing, I want to make one more point about bank holding companies in our country. Nothing in law requires their existence, and they serve no inherent banking purpose. Our country is unusual among modern nations to invoke the concept of bank holding companies. Canada, Germany, France, Switzerland all have robust competitive banks without holding companies. The reasons for enacting the Bank Holding Company Act, which included preventing monopolies, limiting the mixing of banking and commerce, and facilitating geographic expansion in the face of state law restrictions, have largely passed from the scene as federal and state laws have evolved over the past 60 plus years. The more recent use of bank holding companies to manage systemic risk is neither necessary nor entirely effective. What remains is the cost of duplicative regulation and burden that restrict economic potential. For those reasons, bank holding companies may have outlived their practical business value in our financial system and may, in fact, be obsolete. Again, I congratulate the AEI on holding this event and having this important conversation. And I'd be happy to answer any questions as time allows. Thank you, Keith. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, while you uh, think of your questions, uh, may I remind you please to wait for the microphone when you get it. Before you start to speak, give us your name and affiliation and then ask your question. Keith is going to call on you for questions, and my role is to let us know when this question period uh, is over, which will be at 1030. Keith. All right. Yes, Bert. Bert always gets the first question whenever he shows up to my speeches. Uh, Keith, uh, thank you very much uh, for being here. Uh, my question uh, relates to um, uh, what some might concerns, uh, consider to be parochial concerns, and that is, to what extent should the Federal Reserve be concerned about losing regulatory turf? Uh, 
uh, to the OCC and the FDIC and uh, to counter that loss of turf, what can they do to uh, make the holding company uh, structure uh, more appealing to the banks or the Ozarks of the world? Or are they just out of luck? Well, I mean, that's a hard question to answer. I mean, I'm not sure um, we want regulatory agencies competing with one another for, for jurisdiction. I think, um, look, in my own mind, where I've sort of ended up with this is we have a uniquely organically developed regulatory structure in this country. I think it works very well. Um, I think the nice thing about this conference is it gives us a chance to have a conversation uh, about uh, a regulatory structure that, you know, I think we're starting to see in the marketplace, uh, banks reevaluate what their structuring options are, as they always have that choice of whether they have a federal charter or a state charter, whether they're a member of the Federal Reserve System or not. Um, I think what we're seeing is, um, for a long time, I think we've just assumed as sacrosanct that there would always be a holding company. Um, and that just doesn't necessarily have to be the case. And so I think that's an additional element of choice. And I think we've had a nice system of banking regulation where there is an element of choice so uh, banks can have an efficient uh, operation of their organization. And I think we've just come to the point, um, for whatever reason, where holding companies were assumed, but I think we need to start having a conversation in light of the financial crisis and the new restrictions we put on bank holding companies um, whether um, they're really necessary. And so what I sort of pointed out in my speech, and I'll sort of reiter reiter reiterate here, is that, you know, and I think just as a normal lawyer, I would get these questions um, from, from um, former clients of, you would just naturally assume historically that you would have more freedom at the holding company. You could do things, um, you know, better um, in, in the holding company structure uh, that were broader. And that's the whole purpose for a bank holding company, at least if you sort of think about it. You want to keep the bank separate and be able to do more. And I think as that has restricted, um, the utility and value of the holding company goes down. And then you're just sort of left with the bank itself and, and – uh, um, and in and, uh, and many ways, after Dodd-Frank, the bank holding company becomes a, a burden, right, because these, uh, these, these prudential restrictions are triggered by the bank holding company itself. Next question. Such a quiet audience. Alex, you must have a question. Uh, I do have a question uh, um, uh, for you. If you, uh, if you had to guess, looking at the whole banking system with its 6,000 or so depository institutions, going forward from here, uh, as this uh, development of questioning the need for a bank holding company continues, how many, let's say 10 or 15 years from now, uh, what do you think the mix will be of banks with bank holding companies versus ones without Without one, are we going to go back to what it was like in, say, 1950, where there weren't very many bank holding companies? Well, I think a lot depends. There are some sort of decision points coming up in my uh, in my view, um, and and we're starting to see with uh, Bank of the Ozarks, the other one you mentioned, since it's under my regulatory purview, I won't mention the name, but uh, <laughs> um, you know, I think what you're starting to see is what, what do you get out of the holding company versus not having the holding company. Um, and and uh, you know, there's a certain notion that even if uh, regulatory reform doesn't pass or it passes in a more modest way, this is a way for banks potentially to grant themselves some regulatory relief and, and within a fully legal way uh, that comports with the Dodd-Frank Act. And, and in many ways, what I'm thinking about, even with a $50 billion threshold, um, there's the so-called Hotel California provision of Dodd-Frank um, that doesn't allow you to get out of being regulated as a, a non-bank SIFI if you get rid of your holding company. Primarily, it was put there to um, prevent Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley from leaving. Um, but for a, you know, a bank that happens to have a fairly simple business model that's over $50 billion in assets, it, there may be a method um, by which regulators can effectuate sort of uh, a deregulation, if you will, um, and that would be you get rid of the holding company, you petition the uh, um, the FSOC committee 
uh, for a de-designation as a non-bank SIFI. Um, and it, it is a potentially a way where regulators um, can make those judgments of which institutions are, are risky and which ones not um, through sort of an opt-out process. Uh, now that's more cumbersome, obviously, than just granting it to everyone, and then it, presumably the process could work uh, the other way. Um, if, the, if any depository institution were, were risky, they could be, be designated by FSOC. But I, so I think a lot depends on how those type of things play out over time, uh, what the potential utility of having a bank holding company or not uh, may be. And I think a lot also will depend on, um, you know, at the new regime at the Federal Reserve, if they take a more expansive view of financial activities. I mean, over the past, you know, seven to ten years, um, you know, they, those haven't been very expansive. And I've had, you know, my own frustrations, even in the private sector of, you know, you have something like the finder uh, rule, um, you know, that talks about, you know, there might be, you know, something on the World Wide Web. And you talk to some millennial kid and they're like, who, you know, who, who wrote this? regulation, but, you know, it, it, it was a very uh, restrictive uh, regulation that was not given uh, modern uh, expansive authority, whereas at the bank level, uh, I think the bank regulators were what, much more practical a, at that. Um, and so you've almost gotten to the stage when I was, you know, a very young lawyer, um, you would naturally think you could do more at the holding company level than inside the bank or underneath the bank. And by the time I finished being a lawyer before I came here, that was not always the case. Um, and it was surprising sometimes to clients to, to find that. And I think as that became more and more of the case, uh, as well as some of the other uh, benefits uh, going away, such as through the Collins Amendment, um, then, then I think a lot of people are starting to ask why um, they're doing this. And then you couple that with the fact that a bank is not, um, you know, is exempt from the 33 Act uh, for registration purposes. Um, you know, it's kind of becoming a, a th that those are the reasons I think pushing um, people, uh, um, um, bank uh, management away from uh, bank boards away from from holding companies. So we may get a, twi a trend. Uh, you have another question right here. Yes, sir. My name is my name is Leonard Campbell. Um, you've, you've mentioned twice now. Uh, the reluctance of regulators to review in good faith and, and possibly call uh, outmoded or uh, say misaligned regulation. Just wondering if you have any policy prescriptions for resolving that so that they actually do get to doing that. <laughs> well, you know, there are processes in place like the Agripra process. Um, I think where I found it most, um, and look, this may change uh, over time and I think there was a certain political reaction to the financial crisis that made regulators more conservative. Um, but you know, traditionally, especially with respect to bank activities, those are things that have to be decided on the spot as technology develops, as banking develops. Um, and I think there was just a reluctance over the past uh, so many years, especially at the Federal Reserve Board, of um, you know being willing to. Um, to, to sort of take that sort of next step of, of modernizing or at least issuing um, interpretations uh, that would apply their existing regulations in a, in a more modern way. I, again, I think the bank regulators uh, were um, the, the Federal Reserve, I mean the, the OCC and the FDIC were a little bit more um, because they probably dealt with those issues a little more closely. I, look, it doesn't always have to be the case and certainly when Alan Greenspan was there, um, you know, things were a little bit uh, uh, different, and I think a lot will depend on, on what the, what the new, uh, new governors do um, sort of when they're there and their sort of interaction with their staff. Yes. yes. This will be our last question. We uh -huh. have a, a minute or two left. So, Keith, uh, you can't talk about bank holding companies without talking about the, uh, at least with respect to small banks, uh, without talking about the Small Bank Holding Company Policy Act, which actually has encouraged a lot of small banks to continue mm -hmm. keeping their holding companies. And the Crapo Bill would expand that option, as you know, it goes, the thresh asset threshold right now is $1 billion. The CRAPO arrangement, three, uh, yeah. CRAPO bill, would uh, uh, increase that asset threshold up to $3 billion. 
What do you think of, of, of the small bank holding company policy statement? Do you like the idea of, of say, separate requirements at the holding company level? And would you want to expand that? Well, I guess... Okay, excuse me just a minute. Before, uh, before we give up the microphone, remind us who you are and where <laughs> you're from. <laughs> okay. I, uh, my name is Chris Cole, and I'm with the Independent Community Bankers of America, who represent uh, the majority of the small <laughs> banks in the United States. Yeah. Thank you. Well, look, I think, um, I think any asset thresholds have the potential to create disincentives to growth and the like. Um, on the other hand, I, am, I like the idea of having more to be able to done at the holding company. That provides a useful benefit to having the holding company, uh, and it allows them to raise capital potentially more cheaply and to downstream that to the bank and make the banks... Uh, safer and sounder. So, in many ways, like I, I don't. I, I'm obviously very supportive of raising the limit. I think that makes a lot of sense. And even if we're a little higher, that might not be um, the worst thing in the world. Although you have to do what's politically uh, feasible. I think you know where I sort of end up is it doesn't really change sort of what I was just talking about because the bank that you know approaches three then would have the flexibility to get rid of their holding company if that made more sense but I'm all for look I, I you know I, I'm all for I I, I found uh, there was use in having like the holding company be able to do more expansive activities and to raise capital more cheaply for purposes of capitalizing the bank. So if there's still an ability to do that at the smaller bank level, then I'm very supportive of that, and I would be supportive, uh, or I am supportive, uh, of that being uh, more expansive as well. So. Thank you, and with that, we're out of time uh -oh. for Keith. Keith, thanks very much for being well, with us. Thank you very Your much. Great comments, and I look forward to seeing you soon. Okay. Thank you. May I ask the panel members to come up, uh, come up and join me, please? How am I supposed to know you're, you're right here. <laughs> Someday the world will get to realize names Name on tags both need, sides. Need names both sides. on both sides of the platform That's right. is low cost and highly. Well, Larry, just like in musical chairs, take the chair that's available there. Oh, You'll be you. fine. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Here to help. Uh, thank you. Uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen, Keith has set up an interesting question for us to think about, um, uh, one among others. Uh, if the nationwide universal banks of Canada, uh, which have provided a much more stable banking system, at least up to now, uh, than has the United States, uh, if those Canadian banks don't, don't need bank holding companies, uh, why do we? Seems to me the clear answer is that we don't. Uh, bank holding companies and the Bank Holding Company Act are path-dependent artifacts arising out of the unique political history of the United States banking sector. A banking theorist Charlie Calamiris rightly insists that we have to understand that the structure of banking systems arises from deals between politicians and bankers. And once they get established, the central banks are also parties to the deal. Now, this applies very well to the creation of the original Bank Holding Company Act in 1956. As I interpret it, there were two principal, agents, uh, two principal agendas uh, being worked in 1956. Uh, one was obvious and declared. Uh, the other uh, was more hidden. The first was to stop interstate banking, which the holding company had become a means of creating interstate banking, and in 1956 in particular, to stop a single company, as Keith pointed out, Transamerica, the holding company created by A.P. Giannini, who also founded the Bank of America, to stop Transamerica from buying banks in multiple states. Uh, politically, at the time, it was somehow viewed as awful if some banks became a multiple state or even a national business like any other big business. That political idea, powerful for many decades, is dead. <laughs> 
The second agenda, the less obvious agenda, was to increase the power of the Federal Reserve and also to give it a faithful political support group in, in the form of the numerous bank holding companies over which it now got, or then got, substantial regulatory power. Uh, the biggest political promoter of the Bank Holding Company Act in 1956 was indeed the Federal Reserve, which had worked on it for some years. Uh, it likewise lobbied to increase its power further in every subsequent uh, amendment of the act over the succeeding decades. And we have to say that the original Federal Reserve agenda was entirely successful and that the success increased uh, over the, the succeeding six decades. It's often said that the Bank Holding Company Act was to enforce the principle of separate ownership of banking and commerce, uh, but the 1956 Act notably did not do this. Uh, it required Federal Reserve regulation only of holding companies owning two or more banks uh, in the original version, and history tells us that the reason for this was to allow businessmen in many, especially small towns, to own both the local bank and other businesses, which they felt was advantageous to the small towns. So the theory of separation was hardly pure, at least in 1956. Likewise with combating monopoly. Also, uh, it is said, a goal of the original act, but the small banks it intended to protect from competition were often themselves local monopolists uh, or local oligopolists. Uh, as Keith has said, the net effect of the Bank Holding Company Act for most banks now is to create a double layer of regulation. It's easy to understand why the Federal Reserve's lively will to power is happy with this uh, and with the expansion of the Bank Holding Company Act's coverage over time. Uh, for as Alan Meltzer wrote in his magisterial history of the Fed, the Federal Reserve disliked unregulated competition for its own charges, and it still does. And now obviously there's a lot more than that to say about the arguably anachronistic Bank Holding Company Act and how it affects banking, competition, and regulation today. And to explore the issues, we have a truly expert panel with us, and let me introduce them in the order in which they'll speak. Our first panelist, George Sutton, specializes in bank regulation, helping clients with applications for new banks and other regulatory matters, advising boards of directors and management on regulation and corporate governance. George served as the Utah Commissioner of Financial Institutions from 1987 to 1993, where he was responsible for regulating all state charter depository institutions, including the well-known industrial loan corporations. Uh, George continues to serve as counsel to bank trade organizations and on a national bank board of directors. Uh, next will be Wayne Abernathy, the executive vice president for financial institutions policy and regulatory affairs at the American Bankers Association. Previously, Wayne was assistant secretary of the treasury for financial institutions, served as staff director of the Senate Banking Committee under Ch Chairman Phil Graham, was staff director of the Subcommittee on Securities, and his work on the Congress goes back to uh, in the Congress goes back to 1981, which means he was there for the last major changes of the Bank Holding Company Act uh, in 1987 in the so-called Competitive Equality Banking Act. Our third speaker will be Larry White, professor of economics at New York University Stern School of Business. Larry's many publications include the SNL debacle. Public Policy Lessons, and he knows something about that, having been a director of the then Federal Home Loan Bank Board during the 1980s crisis, uh, and as co-author, Guaranteed to Fail, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and the Debacle of Mortgage Finance. It's true, we've had two of these debacles oh, in well, three decades. It was the worst financial crisis we would ever see in our life. The 80s. Right, right. Alex? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, among, Larry's, among Larry's research areas uh, is industrial organization, including the organization of that most unusual industry, the banking system. Our final speaker will be Paul Kupiak, who, as you know, is the organizer of this conference. Thank you, Paul, for bringing us all together for a very timely uh, and important discussion 
Uh, Paul is a resident scholar at AEI, where he applies his innovative perspectives and iconoclastic insights to the study of banks and financial markets, issues of systemic risk, the impact of financial regulations on the U.S. economy. Previously, Paul was director of the Center for, for Financial Research at the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation and chairman of the research task force of the Basel Committee on Banking Supervision. Now, each panelist is going to make opening comments for about 14 minutes, after which we'll give them a chance to respond to each other or to clarify points. Then we'll open the floor to your questions, and we will adjourn promptly at noon. George, welcome, and you have the floor. Thank you. I didn't get a chance to play with this before. Is, can you hear me? Is it broadcasting? And I've got my screen down here. Let me see if I've learned how to. There we go. Oh, there we go. Okay. okay. Let me begin by saying uh, I agree with many of the statements that have been made thus far. Um, my experience now is over a period of 30 years as a regulator, as an attorney helping to put together applications for new banks. Um, I was honored to serve on the board of a large national bank that actually started out as a branchless bank that was part of GE and spun off and is now an independent company with a Fed regulated holding company. And I left that board in at the end of last year and now I am on the board of a community bank. So I've had an opportunity to see from the inside how a lot of the banks are seeing these issues. Now you're going to get some very in-depth analyses from an academic and a political perspective. I'm going to try to give a little bit more of the front line view, what, what we're actually seeing out there outside the beltway as it were. First of all, let me uh, stress there are two different models for holding companies operating out there now. The bank holding company model that the Federal Reserve administers there's an exception to the Bank Holding Company Act for the industrial banks, and that's where the other model comes into play. Both models um, regulate the holding companies and the affiliates, and they utilize essentially the same tools to do that. The regulators can examine the holding companies and affiliates. They can issue cease and desist orders. They can ban individuals and organizations from playing any role in the operation of the bank. They can assess civil money penalties. The Federal Reserve model um, is an independent program. Oh, yes. Thank you. So the Fed model is an independent regulatory model. They regulate, for those of you, I, I'm sorry if this is uh, redundant, but for those of you that are not familiar with these models yet, uh, the Federal Reserve model regulates everything that goes on at the holding company and the affiliates. It's comprehensive. Um, they um, specify the financial structure, they specify the activities that the holding company can engage in. The Holding Company Act prohibits engaging in activities that are not closely related to banking. Uh, this regulatory scheme is not coordinated with the bank. If the FDIC sees something going on at the, at the holding company that's a problem, they have to go to the Fed and ask the Fed to deal with it. However, the Fed likes to really encourage uh, sort of a, uh, a compression of the boards and management of the holding company so that they are the same. And that way the Fed can indirectly regulate the bank by regulating how the holding company is supervising the bank. The bank-centric model is a little bit different. Thank you. I'll get used to this yet. To a business school, George, you'll, you'll get it immediately. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the bank-centric model is a coordinated regulatory scheme. The regulators of the bank regulate the holding company and the affiliates. They do not regulate everything necessarily that is going on at the holding company and affiliates. They do not restrict the activities that can be uh, conducted within the holding company. They can go into the holding company if they see something that is a risk to the bank and deal with that. So they are regulating the relationship between the bank and its affiliates rather than separately regulating the holding company and affiliates. Uh, the model is based on an exemption from the Holding Company Act, uh, sections 23A and 23B of the Federal Reserve Act. 
and state laws. Uh, the Federal Deposit Insurance Act also gives the uh, FDIC authority to go into the holding companies where it is not regulated by the Fed. Uh, um, in addition to the lack of limits on activities, uh, there's a very strong emphasis in this model on insulating the bank and creating an independent functioning bank. So there's a requirement that the majority of the board, for example, be independent outside directors, that it have its own management. Now to evaluate, I, I think comparing these two models is a good way to, to see how these issues are really developing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Remember, banks only succeed in the marketplace. Regulators do not decree the success of banks. They've got to be able to be a successful business. So when we're evaluating the models, I think we need to look at, first of all, and understand what's going on in the businesses themselves, what's going on in the markets, what are the trends, and build a regulatory system and redesign the, the regulatory system constantly to fit that process. So the current model, uh, as I am seeing it, uh, we have three different bank models out there. Um, Vice Chairman Honig did a piece in the American Banker recently that, that highlighted this very well, I thought. Uh, there are the universal banks. These are the full service banks for the large corporations. They're doing investment banking. Uh, the full set of services that that kind of a company might need. These are the ones that are operating internationally. Commercial banks um, are limited more to offering a full uh, array of services of banking services. So lending, deposits, that sort of thing, but they're not getting into these other areas like investment banking. But there's also a third group of banks that are emerging that uh, there's a lot of market demand for this, there's a lot of market pressure to build these banks, and these are the branchless banks. These banks tend to uh, offer specialized banking services to specific customer groups that are based worldwide. Uh, the full service banks, which include the universal, commercial, and community banks, are all regulated under the Fed model uh, and they're fairly well adapted. If I was going to summarize uh, what's happening with the Holding Company Act right now, it would be that it is, it was overkill when it was adopted, it is increasingly outmoded, but there's very little conflict in those areas with the banking operations themselves. Uh, the, full service, the full service banks are fairly well adapted to the, to, uh, the Fed model. The branchless banks are the most innovative and potentially the fastest growing part of the banking industry. These are typically the industrial banks. That's the charter that is available to do this sort of thing right now. Most of these operate branchless, deliver products and services electronically. Um, examples, the large credit card programs are mostly following this model. Now consider American Express and Discover, for example. Others are organized by companies that are engaged in diverse lines of business that see opportunities to provide financial services to their existing customers. Uh, they want to get into banking in these areas because it helps them broaden their, um, their customer relationships. And notice that all of these are based on, a, it's a relationship model. It's just a question of who's the relationship with. Is it with a depositor? or is it with a commercial customer? Let me give you some examples of the specialized banks. A company that owns a nationwide chain of truck stops realized that one of the most underserved and underbanked occupations in the country was long haul truckers. So they organized an industrial bank subsidiary to provide banking services at the truck stops. A client of, ah, thank you. <laughs> Um, a company that's a client of mine specializes in managing large vehicle fleets. Uh, their principal customers are government fleets, and they provide a way to track every vehicle, where it is, what kind of fuel usage it should be having, etc. cetera. Um, they realized that uh, part of that package needed to be a way to purchase fuel, so they organized an industrial bank to provide that, that payment service. Uh, another client of mine is a large electric and gas utility that organized a bank to provide home improvement financing, again nationwide. These are all done branchless. Uh, 
Another client, Pitney Bowes, has organized a bank to finance shipping costs. This trend has uh, proven over now a 30-year period to be very strong and safe. Uh, the branchless banks tend to be more efficient and profitable than the full-service banks. Uh, the savings from not operating branches increases efficiency ratios, makes reward programs possible. Uh, if you're a large credit card issuer, you need these efficiencies. The savings from not operating a branch system, for example, you need those, uh, those efficiencies so that you can fund your rewards programs. Uh, the full-service banks are having difficulty doing that if they were uh, loading all the overhead of their branching systems into that. The opportunities for complementary products and services is almost unlimited if we can begin getting these applications processing again, uh, I think we will see many, many new banks form following this model. The opposition to the bank-centric model um, centers on um, the Fed and our friends at the ICBA. Uh, initially, the opposition was based on the idea that there was a regulatory blind spot in all of this, uh, that the um, banks operating outside of the purview of Fed supervision were a danger to the system. Um, the rebuttal, over time, I think that argument has eroded away because over the 30-year term that these branchless banks have operated, they have consistently been the best capitalized and most profitable group of banks in the nation. There simply is no empirical evidence out there that there is a, a, um, a systemic risk in allowing these banks to operate. Uh, the products and services operate by, uh, offered by the branchless banks are very bankable quality and in very high demand. The latest criticism is that specialized banks offering complementary products and services represent a mixing of banking and commerce. Thank you. Um, which will open the door to uh, large companies organizing competition crushing large banks. Um, but that is not going to happen under the existing law for two reasons. The industrial banks and the banks that are operating under the exemption to the Holding Company Act cannot offer commercial checking and they cannot finance transactions that benefit an affiliate. You add all of that into the mix and the only way they can operate is as specialized, uh, limited purpose banks. There is, and if we look at the markets, there is no trend uh, by banks uh, or there is, an ex excuse me, are we right to the right one? Yeah, one more. There, there we go. There Except for specialized banks owned by commercial companies, there is no trend to mix banking and commerce. I'm sitting on the board of a community bank right now, and we are not looking at all to expand out and get into commercial activities. Uh, first of all, our customers are businesses. If we expand out and begin competing with our customers, <coughs> we're going to alienate them, we're just going to undermine our own business plan. Um, and in terms of competing with the full service banks, if you're hitting the market and you can't offer commercial checking, uh, then you really can't compete for that business, uh, for those business customers. You've got to offer the full plate of services. That's why they operate as specialized banks. Uh, in addition, all banks under sections 23A and 23B, all banks cannot finance transactions with affiliates. So let's take uh, what was the big scare in 1956, and that it's been mentioned, Transamerica acquiring Bank of America. There was a legitimate concern about that. Transamerica was building a monopoly. It was undermining the tradition of decentralizing the banking system that was so critical. Today, if an Amazon decided to buy Bank of America. It may actually have the, <laughs> the resources to do that. If it did that, the first thing it would have to do is convert the charter to an industrial bank because it's a retailer. Secondly, it would have to close all of its commercial checking accounts. And that would be a bonanza for all the other full, full service banks out there. The next thing it would have to do is to inform all of the credit card customers of the bank that they cannot use their cards to buy stuff on Amazon. <laughs> 
And that's going to be a, just a com uh, customer services nightmare. So probably they would end up. This is your one minute warning. Okay, thank you. Uh, so probably they would end up uh, selling the credit card program. They would end up with some specialized lines of business. Amazon is already doing it. It provides commercial financing to some of the companies that uh, sell through Amazon. You'd end up with a very scaled down bank. So that's kind of the future where we're going. Um, current trends, commercial companies are, are tending to divest banks. Banks tie up a lot of capital. They drag down stock prices. Bank multiples on stocks right now are considerably lower than a retailer or a manufacturer. I saw that on the inside when GE did that, and that's one of the reasons they shut down GE Capital. Um, I can get into the strengths and weaknesses. I'd be happy to share the rest of this with you, but I think my time is coming up. And you're correct. Okay. <laughs> so I'll just finish saying the bank-centric model has proven very successful, um, and hopefully it will not go away. These two uh, kinds of banks can develop in parallel. They're not really competing with each other. Thanks very much, George. Wayne. Thank you very much, Alex. Thank you very much to AEI for inviting me to be here. It's a real pleasure to be with you. It's always a pleasure to follow George because I always learn something from him. Uh, and so I, I, I've been learning and taking notes. Now let's see. Oh, look at that. It actually works. My kids would say that's the most important slide. It's not. I'll show you that one in just a moment. Uh, <laughs> we are potentially in a period of significant transition, policy transition, economic transition, very important, this is, this is these, one of these periods in time where a lot is changing and the world will not be the same when this process goes through. We just can't tell you right now how the world will be different, but it's gonna be significantly different over the next several years. And that's an important thing. This is a period when unasked questions can be asked. That was one of the great benefits of having Keith Norica at OCC. He asked questions that nobody at OCC had actually been willing to publicly ask for a long time. And he put a lot of issues out on the table and it's a wonderful thing that he did. Some of those questions we'll even get a chance to answer. Uh, the recent announcement by Zions Bank that they plan or would like to get rid of their bank holding company is one of those questions and an answer that they're putting forward. Bank of the Ozarks and Bank Corp South are also looking at that question and seeing if that is the right answer. Now to answer that question, I want to give an appropriate context. And so the context, I think the, the only question I was gonna ask from Keith Norica, which is what does all of this stuff mean for customers, for bank customers? Because in the end, that's all that policymakers care about. I've learned that through painful talking to policymakers and I've said, do you know how this and that affects my bank and they are very careful to hide their yawns, but they aren't particularly interested. But they are interested when we say, let me tell you how this affects our customers. And that's what matters. And frankly, that's what matters to the banks as well. Banks, since they have been created in the United States, and they go back much farther in, in Europe, but they have been designed to meet specific customer needs that have been developed over time. And this is what I consider to be the most important slide because this shows the competencies that banks have developed over the 200 some years now that we've had banks. And they develop them, they expand them, they come up with new technologies, they come up with new business models, but they're constantly focusing on how to deliver these particular services to customers. Banks provide all of these services. Not every bank provides all of these services, although some do, but all of them provide some of these, and nobody outside of the banking industry provides them all. There are many that try to cherry pick different pieces, but they aren't able to provide the suite of services that banks provide, and this is the very important thing. And banks have developed these, these, uh, these competencies by delivering new technologies and so forth. And I was very pleased in the statement yesterday with Joseph Otting, the new comptroller of the currency when he was sworn and he said, I'm just gonna quote briefly, he says the nation needs federal banking system to be safe and sound to, and this is the important point, deliver its products and services in formats that are available to everyone. Now how do we get there? How do you get available to everyone? In the United States, we have developed a wide variety of different 
bank business models. This is a chart one day I created in my computer before I was off to go and speak at a meeting at the Chicago Federal Reserve. There are probably items that I'm missing there, but these are a variety of the different bank models that are there. Behind each bank model, there are a whole bunch of customers who think that's just the right bank model for what I particularly need. And that's important because all of you who are bank customers, one of those models is there, and you're a customer of the particular bank you're a customer of because it provides those, it has competencies to meet your particular banking needs. Now these diverse structures, um, they're efforts of banks to reach out to their customers in different ways and to change over time. And some of these, these uh, models are new, some of them are very old. There are others that are in the process of being developed as customers, as the banks are continuing trying to find out what is it that people want and how can we provide that. Bank holding companies were one of those structures that was created. Now, sometimes government supports the ability of banks to reach out to customers. Sometimes they get in the way. Bank holding companies were designed, frankly, to get around obstacles that laws had put in place, such as laws on geographic uh, diversification. The bank holding company allowed banks to establish chains of banks or different branches, different banks instead of branches in different locations, and that was a way that they could continue to meet their particular customer needs. It also, and this is an important thing to keep in mind, that the bank holding company act, besides getting around the geographical problems that they faced, through bank holding companies, banks were able to provide additional services that people would say, well, are these really banking or not? They're certainly financial in nature insurance products, securities products, and merchant banking services. But also it's an important thing that the bank holding company structure provides is it allows an important transformation. Banks transform a lot of things. They transform your short-term deposit and put it in a longer-term loan because a business wants to borrow to try something new and the success of trying that something new might not be overnight. It might take some years. They need to be able to have that loan for a period of time. So they take the demand deposit and transform maturity. But what they also do is the bank holding company allows the holding company to take in debt from an investor and convert that into equity, which is then capital, which is then pushed down into the bank itself. Banks like capital because they like money that can absorb losses. Debt doesn't absorb losses very well. It can create loss, but it doesn't absorb loss very well. The holding company can do that, and the holding company's structure helps do that. Now I have here listed just very briefly some of the statutes that Congress has enacted generation after generation fundamentally in support of the concept and importance of banking. Every generation there's a new law, even Dodd-Frank at its core. It's one of those laws that put a lot of obstacles in the way of banking, but at its core it embraces the banking model. It says we need banks in America. It hugs us a little too tightly, and there are some obstacles there we try to get around so that we can, as banks, get to our customers. But even Dodd-Frank is one of those. Now listen, Wayne, I just want to interrupt quickly to say you don't have the Bank Holding Company Act of 1956 on your list. I noticed that. I don't. <laughs> That's because I created this slide some presentations ago. <laughs> I thought this maybe you. We'll, we'll teach you how to modify slides that have already. Been I've prepared. got assistants who help ah. me do that because I'm not very good with this. But that's one that wasn't there. But you're right. That could be on there, and there could be several others as well. Regal Neal could be on there uh, as an example. But let me move to this point here because this is really crucial, and I really want to emphasize this: that that, that what I see today is the greatest challenges to banking, and it might not just be today. I think it's kind of perennial innovation and expropriation. What do I mean by that? Innovation is your needs as a customer, whether you're individual, a business, or a government, are constantly changing because your technologies are changing, your interests are changing. Banks need to innovate to meet your particular needs. Do you remember the names of the banks who didn't innovate? Of course you don't, because they all failed. The banks that have succeeded over time are the ones that succeed in innovating, are able to stay current with your particular needs, customer needs. So that's number one, perennial challenge to bank. Second is expropriation. What do I mean by that? 
since the creation of the first banks back in Europe 500 years ago, government has wanted to take their money. And they found many different ways to expropriate the money of banks. The most significant is private-public partnership. That's where government says, we will provide a benefit to a bank, whatever it might be, if you will partner with us in providing loans to people we want you to provide loans to. Governments try to direct lending in as many different ways. If they won't take the money, they'll try to force the way you use that money. It never ends well. Loans need to be made based upon what makes the sense, best sense for the customer, both in terms of receiving the money and what the customer does with the money and the ability to pay the money back or the other financial services. And government often tries to cut corners on that. Our last great recession was caused by government coercing, encouraging, motivating folks to invest in mortgages beyond what made economic sense. And that pushed up a bubble. And like I say, it never ends well. Now, how do we deal with this? Market discipline. If you'll have more market discipline, what does that mean? It means that the people in this room are the ones who decide where banks are going. You're the ones that decide what banks will do. You'll decide how much they will charge you for it. They charge too much, you won't take it. So I'll have to figure out another way to do something differently. What we want is the customers to decide what they want and let the marketplaces figure out who delivers those best. And those who don't deliver well, you're going to get punished. And I will tell you, the harshest punishment that a bank can receive for doing something wrong and quickest comes from the marketplace. More than whatever a regulator can do. The marketplace will kill you if you're not meeting those particular needs. Now, the last point here. This is uh, many thanks to Alex Pollack, who did a lot of the research behind this list here. If you look at this list, these are the 10 biggest banks in 1981. Now, some of you, you won't recognize any of these names at all. Some of us have been here a while. We can say, oh, well, that's now part of that, or that then became that, or that was bought by this and such and so. The important thing is that there is, has been dynamism. And the fact that the 10 largest banks today are not those 10 largest banks on the charts there is a sign of strength and health because it shows that there is continuous change, which means competition is rewarding and penalizing, and that's what you want to have. If 10 years from now, the list of the 10 largest, most successful banks is the same as it is today, it's a very good sign that the banking industry has become static and is in very serious trouble. The fact that it changes a lot is a very good thing, and we want to encourage that. A dynamic industry is far more important and a sign of health. Now, we support what promotes that competition, what promotes the marketplace, what promotes the ability to serve you. If bank holding companies can do that, that's great. I think some bank holding companies find that that is exactly the structure they need in order to serve their customers. There are others who want to give it up saying, you know, it's just too much cost that doesn't give us anything that facilitates our ability to serve our customers. Great for them to be able to back out. Keep on the watch, though, if the Bank Holding Company Act is being used by government to expropriate that money or to channel where they want the bank funds to go rather than you, the customers, deciding where those bank funds go. What I've been trying to do today is create a context within which we can ask these very important questions of what's the value of the Bank Holding Company? What is the value of the Bank Holding Company Act? And I want to, I'll want i conclude with this by saying, again, bank holding companies provide some very important functions and services, particularly that transformation of debt into equity. Banks that structure these, uh, they're, 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 banks that use a structure that increases their utility to serve you are the ones that are going to succeed. Those that have the structure getting in the way of reaching you, they either need to change that structure or they, in the end, are going to fail, and somebody else, perhaps even outside the banking industry, is going to provide that. Thank you very much for the opportunity Thanks, Wayne. to speak with you. Larry. All right. Uh, so first, that's the highest tech 
thing I know how to do. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Paul, thank you very much for organizing this and inviting me. Uh, as you may have noticed, I'm going, f if we count Keith, I'm going fourth, and you sometimes worry, gee, have all the good lines already been taken? On the other hand, to use a baseball metaphor, I'm batting fourth, I'm batting cleanup. Uh, so uh, as any good business school professor does, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to say, I'm going to say it, and then I'm going to tell you what I said. But I'm going to do business school professor one extra thing. I'd like to hand out hard copy of everything I talk about. And so here is hard copy, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, hey, Larry, will you take the microphone so that you're recorded for posterity while you're doing this? He's no, right I, here. I speak loud. No, 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 no. You have to be on the recording. There's a microphone right there. There you go. There you go. Let me let me just there add the, the exam. The, other, the exam is at twelve. There's an exam at twelve. <laughs> and the other important thing, since I'm a good microeconomist, those of you who have economics 101, supply will exceed demand. Here, okay. So there you have it. Oh, hold, hold I guess on. that wait, means wait, the I guess that you. means the price will go down. Larry. Well, yes, but the value shouldn't be confused with the price. Here. All right, and gentlemen, here's one. All right. So here we go. Thank you. You want to do roving here? No, I'll I'll, I'll sit. Okay. I'll sit back. Okay. Here's your here's your mic. All right. So uh, Alex was worried I wouldn't have enough time. I assured him I'm from New York. I speak quickly. <laughs> so first thing, did this make it? Ah, good. It did. I was afraid the different screen might distort this. This is. Bank Accounting 101. This is what a solvent bank looks like. This is what a healthy bank looks like. And you have to remember uh, the notion of what's an asset and what's a liability is exactly backward for a bank. The assets of a bank are the loans. They're assets because the bank expects to get repaid with interest. The liabilities are the deposits. You think of your deposit as an asset. For the bank, it's a liability because it owes the money to you. And if you subtract the, the deposits from the assets, what's left over is the company's net worth or owner's equity or in the world of banking, it's called capital. Now, of course, this should be based on market values, but that's a separate conversation. Just to remind you, whoops, all right, that one didn't make it, but I think you can get the sense of what the meaning there is. If the assets have shrunk relative to the liabilities, this is an insolvent bank. Alas, 30 years ago, we saw way too many of these uh, in the form of insolvent savings and loans. Even 10 years ago, an unknown story, or little known story of the financial crisis is there were over 500 depository institutions, they were all modest size or small size, went insolvent, caused a uh, somewhat of a crisis for the FDIC during the time that Paul was there. All right, so banks are special. In a sense, that's why we're here. If we were talking about dry cleaners or the uh, corner grocery store, you people wouldn't be here. But we're talking about banks, and they are special. They're opaque. They're hard for outsiders to understand. They're important for lending. They're important for deposits. They're important for the payment system. They are fragile. They are susceptible to depositor runs. Uh, they, why is that? Because they've got this inherent or generic uh, combination of assets that tend to be illiquid and long-term in nature. Th and they have liabilities that are short-term and, uh, uh, and thought of as liquid. And so that means this institution is runnable. Um, this, uh, you know, this fragility is uh, inherent in the transformation that was talked about, talked about before. And indeed, any financial institution that combines this uh, long-term long illiquid assets with short-term liquid liabilities is going to be fragile, is going to be unstable, which we learned 
10 years ago, gee, there were these five large investment banks that uh, three of them had a trillion dollars each in assets, had issued a bunch of short-term liabilities. Uh, another two had 700 billion and a mere 400 billion dollars, and we know how that story ended. All right, they're special, um, and they may fail. Uh, they can fail because of mismanagement. They can fail because uh, you get de the depositors starting to get nervous. They're, they're, it's tough for them to know, is their bank uh, uh, solvent or not? Will the bank be able to redeem their deposits or not? Uh, and so we can get runs. You can tell a contagion story of uh, depositors uh, look across the street and see that there are, are uh, across the street there are depositors of that bank lining up and the depositors of the first bank start to get nervous and they start to line up. Or you can tell a cascading story of uh, you know, one bank uh, becomes insolvent, fails, and that causes other banks that have uh, deposits with the first bank to uh, similarly get into trouble. And Compounding all of this problem is if banks try to sell their illiquid, long-lived assets to satisfy the demands of the depositors, they're not going to be able to do that at any reasonable set of prices if they try to do that quickly, and so they will incur losses, and that can lead to the insolvency. And these closures have real costs for their customers. Again, we're not talking about the closure of the local dry cleaners on the corner or the local grocery store. Depositors lose their funds uh, and borrowers need to find other lenders and those relationships are important, especially on the borrowing side and it may be difficult for them to find alternative lenders. Hey Larry, yeah. I'm just, uh, I'm tracking your time. I think maybe you ought to I got to talk even faster. I think you ought to get into the bank owner who should okay. be the bank all right. owners. So, um, all right, good. So we've got the kind of safety and soundness of uh, regulation that we've talked about up to this point. Uh, the activities re uh, restrictions, the number three point is one I'm going to come back to. And of course we have deposit insurance to protect depositors against regulatory failure. If you th really think about what I've just said, it's to protect depositors against regulatory failure. All right, if we're going to have safety and soundness, regulation, what should be the appropriate activities for a bank? Activities that are examinable and supervisable, that the regulators can set appropriate capital requirements and, and essentially assess the competency of the management in the activity. And if you think about it, why should activities that are examinable and supervisable not be allowed for a bank? Uh, now, what do we mean in practice? Well, it's going to depend on regulatory competence. For sure, loans. Uh, after that, uh, you know, it really depends on regulatory competence. What are the inappropriate activities for a bank? Those that are not examinable and supervisable, where the regulator can't figure out an appropriate capital requirement, can't make assessments of the overall competency of management to run those activities. And again, how could you allow banks to undertake activities that are not examinable and supervisable? And I give you some examples there of, uh, you know, suppose the XYZ National Bank wants to run a deli or run a car dealership or, you know, any other commerce type activity and you can see where the idea of the separation of banking and commerce might arise. In principle, bank regulators might hire experts to help them figure out uh, capital requirements and competency. Life's too short and so you can well imagine why the idea a bank shouldn't be doing these things. All right, what about the bank's owners? It's important to remember. A bank owner can be an individual or it can be a holding company. And remember, holding companies have owners as well. And um, owners, whether they are individuals or bank holding companies, can drain 
the bank of its assets at the expense of depositors or the deposit insurer. They can declare excessive dividends to themselves. They can engage in self-dealing. Piece of cake. Uh, and that's a way to drain the bank. All right, got to keep that in mind. Now, are bank holding companies special? Well, as we've heard up till now, starting in 1956, arguably even back in 1933 with Glass-Steagall, they've been treated as special. They've been essentially restricted to activities that are closely related to banking. But Direct bank owners, the individuals, are not similarly restricted, and so the local car dealer can own a bank directly, but AutoNation Inc., which is a publicly traded company that owns a bunch of car dealers, cannot form a bank holding company. Why do we have this distinction? All right, so I'm going to come back to that in a minute. What should be the appropriate activities for the bank's owners? Well, anything that is otherwise legal, but as we just heard a few minutes ago, you've got to worry about those transactions between the bank and its owners, the owner's friends, the owner's relatives, and that's what we have Federal Reserve Act uh, Section 23A and 23B to do, essentially give the Fed monitoring powers to restrict those transactions, make sure they are uh, on arm's length, and that applies to whether the owner is an individual or a bank, or a, or a bank holding company. And here is the diagram. Uh, you know, this is not quite a 1930s radio wiring diagram, uh, but you know, the important thing is on the left-hand side you've got the bank, and it should have the appropriate activities that I talked about before. Elsewhere, you have other parts of the bank holding company or its subsidiaries, and um, those are the other activities. I'm going to come back to the bank subsidiary and to the holding company in just a few minutes. Where did policy go wrong? Well, arguably it started with Glass-Steagall restricting not only the bank but the bank holding company from investing, uh, investment banking activities for sure by the Bank Holding Company Acts of 56 and 70. We were going way in the wrong direction. SIBA made it even worse. Graham Leach Bliley made it worse by freezing the uh, number of thrift holding companies to the number that were then in ex existence. Dodd-Frank made it worse by freezing, imposing a moratorium on the, any new ILCs that could get FDIC insurance and um, uh, even though that moratorium expired four years ago, uh, the FDIC has continued, to my knowledge, not granted any new deposit insurance. And it was basically American. All of this reflects American, alas, American populism. Where did public policy go right? Well, the savings and loan industry did have the ability to have a bank holding company that allowed its owners to do commerce type things. Ford Motor Company at one point owned a uh, savings and loan, a thrift. There were other industrial uh, companies that did and it's important to remember the, these holding companies did not pose problems for the thrifts in the 1980s. Those problems or originated in other problems, other situations, not because there were non-bank holders. Regal Neal uh, was a good thing. It removed those restrictions on interstate banking. Graham Leach Bliley allowed uh, bank holding companies to get back into investment banking. That was good. And the whole idea of an ILC uh, is a good idea because it allows non-financial companies to uh, own a bank. But alas, since uh, 2000 and, uh, well, 2010, we haven't had any new ILCs. All right, why does this matter? Good, I've got one, one minute. One minute. Good, uh, because we're losing potential efficiencies. We're losing potential competition, competition uh, among banks. Yeah, you heard the existing banks don't particularly want to get into commercial activities. Of course not. They've adapted to the existing legal structure. But you know, what about entry? What about disruption? 
What about something like Walmart getting into banking and providing more low-cost financial services to low- and moderate-income households? Here are some data on the unbanked and underbanked population. FDIC data, circa 2015. You know, this, these are non-trivial numbers here. In addition, it would be nice to let either banks, if the activity is examinable or supervisable, to get into something like real estate brokerage. Or if it's not examinable and supervisable, let the bank holding company do real estate brokerage. This was a hot topic about 10 years ago. Then the controller said, this is not related to banking, and shut, shut down the process. All right, get so. You, I think we right, need we to go to worry. the conclusion. Right, we got to worry about uh, if the bank holding company essentially becomes a financial institution, and you've got to worry about uh, fully capitalized, uh, separately capitalized uh, uh, sub subsidiaries of the bank. So, the important points here, think examinable and supervisable. Think for the bank. Think basically anything else for the activities of the bank holding company. Think sections 23A and 23B for the monitoring of those transactions to make sure the bank doesn't get drained for the benefit of the owners. Think sec sensible economic policy to expand efficiencies and synergies, improve com competition, allow entry, disruption, and expand worthwhile financial and non-financial services. Think modifying the bank holding company. Thank you, Larry. Paul. I'm going to take a little different tact. I'm going to, I'm going to go back in history and look at the Bank Holding Company Act from 25,000 feet, 30,000 feet, and sort of see what it was made for, where did it come from, do those reasons still exist? So the push for the Bank Holding Company Act really began in the New Deal, Franklin Roosevelt. Um, the 1933 Glass-Steagall Act actually set sort of the basis for it. It separated commercial and investment banking. It required holding companies, owners of holding companies, who had a controlling interest in a Federal Reserve member bank to get a permit from the Federal Reserve Board before they were allowed to vote their shares. So they, asked to have to ask to ask, they had to ask the Fed for permission to vote their shares if, if they had a controlling interest in a Federal Reserve bank. It, established Section 23A and 23B, which prohibited banks from providing affiliates with underpriced credit. It also, interestingly, what's old is new again, it created a sort of 50% TLAC requirement for bank holding companies. If TLAC, if you're not part of there, it's total loss absorbing capacity. What it did was, within the first five years of the 33 Act, if you were a holding company, the, you, you needed to create a liquidity buffer portfolio in your holding company that didn't include any bank stocks that was at least 25% of the par value of the bank stock you owned. And you had to, any holding company earnings above 6% of a return on the, on the holding company's book value of its stock, it had to keep and invest in a liquidity portfolio until it had 25% of the value of the bank stock that it owned. So even back then, they had something they called TLAC. They just something like TLAC, but they didn't call it TLAC. It was a liquidity portfolio. Now, the catalyst for the 1956 Bank Holding Company Act was the 1948-49 defeat when the Federal Reserve Board tried to sue Transamerica Corporation for antitrust violations. Um, the defeat set the precedent, potentially, that you could interstate branch using a bank holding company and that that was a legal vehicle. And so the Bank Holding Company Act was really passed to stop this um, from happening. But on my earlier slide, back in 1938, President Roosevelt, who, who very much didn't like things like holding companies, wanted to stop the growth of holding companies, and he wanted them to be uh, disbanded over a period of time. He recommended that in his 1938 antitrust program. I also want to mention back that Bank Holding Company Act, anything about the Bank Holding Company Act, it isn't really economics. I'm an economist. You go look for things about the Bank Holding Company Act, you end up in law journals. So the Bank Holding Company Act is really about lawyers. And <laughs> there's a story behind every law that's passed, which creates all this, but there's not always economics behind every law that's passed, so keep that in mind. And so I'll tell you the story behind the laws that were passed. So back in 1933, people 
were of the impression that all the bank failures that happened in the early 30s might in part happen because banks were competing too hard with one another. They were paying too much for deposits and they were lending too cheaply and this extra competition um, was a cause of, of, of many of the thousands of banks that failed in the late 20s and early 30s. Or, and, and what they wanted to do was they didn't want banks competing. They wanted the, a safe bank system was a protected banking system, so they really didn't want branches, bank branching, to compete, which we know the, that's exactly opposite for economics. If we had a branch banking system, the system would have been much safer. But back then, I said economics doesn't cause laws, but stories do, and that was the narrative that was being told uh, and in, in ways to protect community bankers, small bankers from, from, from competition. So the Bank Holding Company Act allowed the Fed to control group banking. Um, an owner of 25% or more of a controlling interest, 25 or 25% or more of a stock, in two or more banks must form a holding company and submit to Federal Reserve Board regulation. Uh, they had to liquidate ownership and commercial affiliates. And the, the board would look at new bank holding company acquisitions. Any, any new acquisitions by a holding company would have to be approved by the board. Um, it would be contingent on things like, did it have adequate capital? What was the moral character of the, B, the bank holding company management? Were there community benefits being generated by this acquisition? And the whole community benefits thing is kind of a, you know, who, who says there's community benefits or not? So that's a real fuzzy kind of, kind of concept. But the BCA, the Bank Holding Company Act, prevented banks from circumventing interstate branching. The Transamerica Corporation had acquired banks in California, Washington, Oregon, Nevada, and Arizona. And another thing the Bank Holding Company Act really established was this notion that the Fed is the consolidated supervisor. When William McChesley Martin was testifying on the Bank Holding Company Act in 1955, they asked him a question, and he said in his interpretation, the Bank Holding Company Act requires the Federal Reserve Board to regulate bank holding companies as if they were banks. So this is kind of this whole idea that, well, you regulate a bank holding company just like it's banks. So we have capital requirements for banks, capital requirements for bank holding companies. We have independent examinations for banks and separate independent ex examinations for bank holding companies. We have regulatory reports for both. Um, and dueling, you can see my play on words there. Duel is for two, should have an A, not an E. But dueling, dueling bank regulators, uh, you know, the OCC and Fed, mostly the ones going toe to toe about can, the power, can something be done in a bank or does it have to be done in a bank holding company? And until Dodd-Frank, banks had their own separate administrative resolution authority uh, through the FDIC and the good folks here would resolve a failing bank and a bank holding company would go through bankruptcy. But in the Dodd-Frank Act, we made it possible for a bank holding company to go to, through the bank resolution scheme through orderly liquidation authorities. Now, now we've extended that whole idea that a bank holding company is, is like a bank a, instead of being different when, when all along they were supposed to be different. By the way, holding companies are not all that old. I think the first holding company was formed in 1926 in Seattle, Washington. So banks existed long before there was anything like a holding company. So the BCA, Bank Holding Company Act, gave the Fed the ability to control market entry. There were some ex exceptions to that, though. One bank holding companies were excluded from the 56 Act. And there were a lot of one bank holding companies. That's why they were excluded. They had the political power to get excluded from the Holding Company Act. They were primarily East Coast. A lot of the big banks in New York were one bank holding companies. Thrift holding companies were excluded. Credit card banks, which didn't exist back then, but now do. They're excluded. ILCs, industrial loan corporations. None of these charters was subject to the Bank Holding Company Act, and people say they closed those loopholes over the years, but they weren't loopholes at the time. Congress expressly excluded those charters from being part of the Bank Holding Act because those charters were important and had political power at the time. Um, is the Bank Holding Company Act about safety and soundness or something else? Now, I looked pretty hard this week, um, and I can't find anywhere where it's ever been demonstrated that a bank that's owned by a Federal Reserve Board regulated bank holding company is any safer than a bank that is not part of a federal regulated uh, BHC. The, there's, an, there's an FDIC study on ILCs from the early 2000s, which shows that, yeah, ILCs fail, but they don't fail any, any more regularly than anybody else, and all, all bank charters fail with about the same frequency. There's another study that says that since the crisis, uh, the, the, the probability of failure of a bank that's a member of a bank holding company is three basis points lower, which is 
economically not important than the other ones in their regression model. That paper hasn't been published. I would also like to say there's historical evidence that banks that were member, members of holding companies were a bigger problem when they failed than banks that weren't. We had the M Corp case in the 1980s where the M Corp owned a lot of banks that failed and they would pass on the good assets to the bank, other banks in the holding company and leave the bad assets in the banks that failed and the FDIC would have huge loss rates in which case the Congress came back in later acts and established Federal Reserve cross-guarantee powers where it could assess a banks and a holding company uh, for losses that, uh, of one of the banks if the other ones were still solvent. And it did this because the bank, the, the Federal Reserve source of strength doctrine actually failed. So this notion that the source of strength doctrine is, is really something that makes uh, everything, uh, you know, rock solid is, 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 is not really there. So when you come to the Bank Holding Company Act, I think as you'll see, some, some love it. And I think, this is, this is of course my opinion, politicians have learned to love the Bank Holding Company Act, mainly one, after they got the Community Investment Act passed in 1977, which requires regulated financial institutions have a continuing and affirmative obligation to help meet the credit needs of their local communities in which they are chartered. Used in conjunction with the Bank Holding Company Act, politicians can use this to harvest and squeeze out all kinds of loans. I think Wayne was alluding to this earlier, but maybe it was flew over in the in the fog over over us. But but they do. They and it's really amazingly funny. Bank 20, Section 23A and 23B of the 33 Act says a bank is not allowed to make a loan to an affiliate on terms that aren't market based. Yet the Community Reinvestment Act comes back and says, if you want to have the Fed approve a merger between two banks and a holding company, you're going to have to go make loans to my favorite group of individuals in some market at below market rates. So, I mean, <laughs> it, it, it's kind of crazy. It, it, it Maybe as crazy as the fact that if you calculate interest rates under the Truth in Lending and Truth in Savings Act, you get different interest rates. So which is, which is the truth? Try it. Try that at your next cocktail party. That's a fun one. <laughs> Anyway, so, but this just proves that, uh, to borrow a phrase from Clausewitz, that the Federal Reserve is just the extension of politics by another means. <laughs> anyway, so commercial, who hates it? Commercial firms. They're continually frustrated from entry into banking. Every one of the amendments to the Bank Holding Company Act has whittled down the charters and the, and the ability of commercial firms to enter banking. In 2006, the ILC charter came under direct attack when Walmart and Home Depot tried to form ILCs. FDIC put a moratorium on it for a while. The crisis came around, then Dodd-Frank was passed, and they said you couldn't have, yeah, there was a stay on ILC charters. It expired, and only recently a few fintech firms have filed for ILC charters. And so that debate is now, now in, the, in, the, uh, in, in the news again. Um, let me go on. And some aren't sure about the bank holding gap, whether they love it or they hate it. And, and this group right now is the banks. So historically, the banks like the B Bank Holding Company Act because the Fed protected them from competition. They had to approve mergers and B bank holding company purchases. Uh, the, the, the act uh, prohibited competition from commercial entrance in, into the system, uh, except for the special charters, which over time were system, have been systematically eliminated. Credit card banks and ILCs are the only ones that, that are still there. And the Fed sweetened the bank holding company idea, uh, the, the appeal of that form of, in the 1990s when it included trust preferred securities as part of bank holding company tier one capital. So it allowed double leverage. Essentially the holding company could issue debt and it could downstream it to the bank as equity. Now the banking regulators never accepted uh, pr trust preferred securities as capital. So you had to have a holding company to do it, but that was, that was one of the pot sweeteners. And then the banks paid for this sort of ability for cheap capital and protection with this Community Reinvestment Act ransom that they had to pay from time to time. Um, the new Dodd-Frank safety and soundness requirements have raised the price of the Bank Holding Company Act. Uh, you can't use trust preferred securities anymore uh, in large banks, uh, and so some banks are jettisoning their holding companies. Uh, Zions Bank, as I mentioned earlier, and that's just the latest. Uh, the other banks were mentioned, Bank of the Ozark, Bank of the South, and interestingly, if you go on corporate governance websites like the Harvard Law School's website, you'll find legal position papers, uh, not just now, they, starting a, more than a year ago, advising banks that uh, 
Really, it was your fiduciary duty to, to look at this carefully and jettison your bank holding company structure. You don't get that many benefits from it anymore, as, many, as, as, as Keith and other people have said. And the costs, the costs are there. They're, they're, they're higher. They're higher. And, and so we're seeing some of that. So in my final slide, I, I probably only have a half a minute here, you know, is the bank holding company really needed for sa safety and soundness? Now, I think I skipped a point earlier where since the Dodd-Frank Act required GAO to look at it, and they found that the credit card banks and ILCs, which have no bank, Fed, Federal Reserve Bank holding company regulation, are completely well regulated. There's no problem there at all. So the, the, the notion that this holding company regulation somehow is needed, uh, the GAO dismissed that. They said, no, nope, no, nope, ILCs and credit card banks, we can't find any problems there. We don't need a holding company regulator. So that's the first thing. But I think there are historical examples uh, where this idea of mixing commerce um, with cheap access to credit, and it's not always credit from a bank, has, has been troublesome. In the SNL crisis, when Garden St. Germain Act changed the ownership uh, requirements for SNLs, you had SNLs being bought by construction and development companies in Texas and, and, and run for the benefit of, of both. The bank would make the loan to make the housing loans, and then it would do the mortgages, and then you know the loans would go bad, and they'd go and find out that, you know, basically the th they'd robbed the thrift, and, and th that was problematic. Um, the, the tech bubble is often given as an example of a, of a case where there was this financial crisis and it didn't have huge economic effects like a, fin like a fin but what, if you go back and you actually read what happened a lot in the tech crisis, many of the tech firms actually were their own banks. They had, they had cheap stock, they could raise a lot of capital, and what they did was things like Cisco and Lucent and Motorola, the, the hardware providers for the tech revolution ended up financing all of the purchases of the other firms that were setting up internet wires. And, and when the internet bubble bust, the, a huge portion of, of those big tech firms' losses was in fact because they were internally being banks. And they had this access to cheap credit because of this sort of tech market bubble. So they, 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 they weren't, it wasn't a banking issue, but it, it was related to access to cheap credit. And the, One minute. Oh, I got plenty of time. And the, house, <laughs> and the housing crisis. If my colleague Peter Walson were here, he would jump on this. So, you know, yes. mortgage-backed securities, senior subordinated, it, it was a, you know, it was, a, it was the, the Midas machine. You could take lead and turn it into gold and make money. Well, lots of people did, and they, and, and they needed real side mortgages. They needed to make mortgage loans in order to do this, so that went out, and people started offering all kinds of things with teaser rates and everything else, which were, you know, if they, if they went to maturity, they'd been very expensive mortgages, but they were refinanced, and it was essentially a, a, a sort of bubble cheap form of, of, of financing, and then you had that GSE step in to buy a whole lot of this stuff for affordable housing goals, so it wasn't through the banking system, but you did have this machine that generated uh, because of irrational expectations about the, the ability of these, you know, securitized products to actually hold up and, and the mix of government subsidized financing. You had this cheap credit that mixed with a business model to, to sell housing and, and promote housing. And so, you know, I think there are examples where, you know, mixing cheap credit, it's not always in the banking system with, with uh, sort of unsafe lending practices creates economic problems. So, uh, but it's not clear to me the Bank Holding Company Act is the thing that, f that fixes those kind, kinds of problems. So I'll just stop there. Thanks, Alex. Thank you, Paul. And thanks to the panel for a series of really interesting discussions. I want to, or we don't have a lot of time left, but I want to give the panelists uh, a chance to have, make any responses or further comments. One minute or absolute maximum two minutes uh, each if you have some uh, uh, next uh, series of comments. We'll just go down the, the panel and see George. Actually, I'll pass this to Wayne. Okay, Wayne. Well, I just have one issue I want to put on the table, and this is one that's really concerned me in the Dodd-Frank Act, but watching over the years, it, it, it in very, very large degree began with the Bank Holding Company Act, and that is the concentration of too much power at the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve wants to maintain its independence, and we like the idea of having an independent monetary policy but the more power the Federal Reserve acquires, the more difficult it is to maintain its independence. Our political system is inimical to the idea of having a whole lot of political power that is somehow walled off 
from the public and from the politicians. And what, you'll, what you already see happening, you saw it with the question of who was going to be the Federal Reserve Chairman when uh, Chair Yellen was, uh, was appointed, was an incredible, very public political contest of who was going to run the Fed, but very predictable because of the amount of power that the Fed obtained, the Bank Holding Company Act, the Dodd-Frank Act, and other things as well. If you are concerned about maintaining the independence of the Fed, you need to look at and ask, does the Fed have too much non-monetary policy responsibility? Thank you. Larry? Uh, oh, uh, I think I agree with Wayne about the, uh, you know, worrying about the excessive power at the Fed. I wonder if that is a backdoor way of saying expanding the opportunities for bank holding companies and for commercial entities to own a bank as long as 23A, 23B, et cetera, et cetera. Are you going there, Wayne? No, I'm just saying you need to examine how much responsibility okay. is given to the Fed and what Good. the purposes are okay. and ask, Good. do they really need to have this? Good. Do they need to have that? And keep in mind that as you're giving power to the Fed, you're eroding its independence. Okay. Good. And then in that case, I'm, I'm in agreement. And again, I would just repeat the point of, yeah, existing banks feel comfortable with much of the structure that surrounds them. They've adapted. They're comfortable with it. But as I hope uh, my argument has shown, and I heard Paul echoing much of it, what that means is we don't get entry where entry could really be beneficial. And you know, if you want to use the uh, you know, Silicon Valley tech uh, phrase, we don't get the disruption that entrance could bring to financial services. Thank you, Paul. Final shot here. Uh, if we have any audience left, Woo. I'll defer to them. <laughs> Woo. I would. Woo. No hey, we're going to keep before. going. <laughs> let's, let's take questions from the audience. All right. Oh, let's uh, hang on. Imagine that. Imagine. Did, did somebody try to call on a questioner? No, no. Just no, let's no, have no, a little patient. discipline no, I, on I, this I, panel. I, 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 I couldn't restrain my. I couldn't restrain myself. <laughs> I'm going to call this gentleman before Bert right here. Now, let me remind you of the. Uh, again, please wait till the microphone is there. When you get us, tell. When you get it, tell us uh, who you are. Uh, what your affiliation is, and ask your question. If you uh, precede your question by a lecture, at one minute, the chair will remind you <laughs> that it's time to ask your question. So right here, please. Sir, uh, Brian Knight at the, from the Mercatus Center. Uh, so let me play devil's advocate here for a second and say that uh, one, of the, one of the concerns that is often expressed about the mixing of business and commerce is it allows the public subsidy for banking to advantage the commercial parent at the cost of, or you know, to the detriment of that parent's competitors. Um, and that 23A, 23B, some people are very skeptical of how effective it really is. So I'd just like the panel to sort of respond to, you know, what do you think, do you think that's really a threat? Do you think the, uh, the positions or the rules in place are adequate? Or is there something else that should be done short of a full bar? Okay, this is a, something we hadn't touched on, but I think it is an interesting question. How does the deposit insurance uh, uh, benefit enjoyed by the banks fit into the bank holding company discussion? Anybody want to take that on? Well, I, I think that argument is largely bogus. Um, again, the commercial companies that are organizing banks are organizing either standalone operations or complementary kinds of products and services. Think about the, the trucking company that has the truck stops. It's providing banking services to truckers at the truck stops. The only benefit that company gets out of that is a deepening customer relationship. More people come and do business there. And the dividends they get out of the bank. I know Professor uh, Walmarth at George Washington has uh, challenged the efficacy of 23A and 23B. I can tell you from direct experience that those uh, laws are very vigorously enforced. The only way a bank finances its parent and affiliate using federally insured deposits is if there's a cash deposit in the bank that secures the entire portfolio. Uh, 
or if the loans that originates are bought out without recourse. Um, I, I've been doing this for a long time. A big part of my practice has been giving opinions on compliance with 23A and 23B. There's a very rigorous separation between the commercial parent and the banking operation. Paul, you had I'll, a comment? Yeah, I'll jump in. I think, I think in the SNL crisis, there was a breakdown in supervision. Uh, there's a paper floating around by um, some folks at the Federal Reserve Board where, where it turned out in, in that period in District 9 of the Federal Home Loan Bank District, Texas, Arkansas, uh, they moved the headquarters of the Federal Home Loan Bank from Arkansas to Texas, and, 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 and all but only two examiners went. So the whole region where all this fraud was essentially going on, self-dealing, they had two examiners to examine like a hundred some institutions. So you can imagine how well that worked. And, and the answer was it didn't work. Larry could tell you it didn't work very well at all. That was a total, total breakdown in the regulatory structure. Um, there are papers that uh, ad address this, this kind of issue. And, and there's some simple solutions. Uh, you could have, you know, you can mix commercial and, 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 uh, and, banking in a holding company, but not allow the bank to fund affiliates. The holding company would have to do all the funding. So anything would have to go up to the holding company before it went to a commercial affiliate. There, there are solutions like that if you don't believe in 23A and B. Um, but fundamentally, I, I think with, with the level of supervision and regulation that we have in the United States, all these regulators, that could be a problem in special cases, but it, but it shouldn't be. I think it's a failure of, of, of regulation when it happens, and it, and it certainly happens from time to time, but I, I, don't think it's, I don't think in general it's a systemic problem. Thank you. Uh, and now, uh, now, oh, if I could. Uh, go let, ahead, George. Let me just add one more comment. The bankers, the bankers themselves strongly support 23A and B. I mean, this is a real issue. If you are affiliated with a company that has a lot of diverse activities, there can be lots of instances where there's pressure brought on the bank to do something inappropriate. And the, uh, the people who manage that bank, and especially the outside directors and the independent management, they love to be able to say, well, I can't do that. That would violate 23A and 23B. And I've given, uh, again, lots of opinions to the holding company that you cannot cross that line. You cannot ask them to do this. And it, it really keeps things separated. Uh, that's extremely important. And, uh, there are, there's no trend out there that I'm aware of to weaken or eliminate 23A and 23B. Thank you. Bert. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Bert Ely, Banking Consultant. Uh, I have a follow-on on question. Uh, again, it comes back to uh, not just deposit insurance, but uh, uh, safety net uh, concerns and, and, and fears of contagion. It, it seems to me that uh, a key factor that has, at least in recent decades, been such a shaping factor, if you will, in uh, in, in banking legislation, uh, uh, in, including Dodd Frank, and that is the fear of uh, another taxpayer bailout of of the safety net, such as we had uh, after the the SNL crisis. And I was wondering if the panel could could address uh, that aspect of what has been driving. Uh, public policy and legislation in, re in recent decades, and that is trying to protect the, uh, the taxpayer in one way or another. But Bert, mm -hmm. we, did, we did have another big bailout, <laughs> and the bank holding company regulation was fully in place for 2008. I mean, the bank holding companies were the biggest recipients of, of TARP. I mean, uh, it's so- not true. Uh, no? It's not true. The biggest recipients of TARP were the several hundred smaller banks that actually got far more proportionately TARP money than did okay, the largest but the big banks. ones got it first. The largest banks paid it back at about a 12% interest rate. A and some people became bank holding companies in order to get yeah, the support. Tarp. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> TARP was a very bad idea. I don't want to say it was I a agree, good idea. But to but say that, well, that, well, that's what really benefited the big banks. The big no, banks no, paid okay. enormous amount of money okay, for that. I'm not picking on the big banks. Okay. But the point, <laughs> the point was <laughs> bank holding company regulation didn't stop oh, the systemic problem. That was I agree. my major point. I don't differ with that at all. Okay. When Anybody I was else? a regulator, we, we closed um, a third of the banks in Utah by number, not by assets. There was a real shakeout. It was during the, the SNL crisis. Every one of the banks we closed had a bank holding company that was completely helpless 
to do anything about the failure of the bank and the cost to the FDIC. Um, a, a, a traditional bank holding company, there is no reason at all, no economic reason to park a lot of additional assets in that company. And so this whole s source of strength doctrine is really bogus in the sense that if you look at it, you get below the SIFI level. I'm not talking up at that level, but you get down to the smaller companies. These are just shells that sit over the bank. And when the bank gets in trouble, they can't raise any new capital because they have to publicize the bank's problems. Now contrast that with uh, the typical industrial bank with a commercial parent, which has lots of additional assets. Within the industry, uh, the industrial banks to the largest extent uh, have no issue at all raising all the capital they ever need. It's a phone call to the parent. If they need additional capital, and we've even seen this where a bankrupt parent was able to provide additional capital to its industrial bank subsidiary. Uh, the industrial banks have not failed because, in part, because they have that level of capital support. There is a real source of strength sitting up there over the bank. Now, if you repeal the Bank Holding Company Act, we're not going to see a big shift over to commercial companies owning the full service banks. I think that situation is going to continue. But bear in mind that there is absolutely no reason to repeal that exemption for the industrial banks because you're protecting the safety net. You want that strong parent that can do that for you. I want to, in this uh, context, could I just yeah, give please, you stick in, yeah. in a thought here? Uh, uh, Larry made a very important point, which is to think about the, what's the difference between a corporation that owns a bank and an individual that owns a bank. Uh, and throughout banking history, one of the problems you always have is individuals who own banks and, and their cronies on and the self, board. Self-deal. Self-deal. Self self deal. This is a, a, a recurring problem, which we, we know you have to have good rules for. But individuals uh, might also be sources of strength for their bank. It depends a lot on the financial resources of the individual. Uh, J.F.T. O'Connor tells a wonderful story from the 1930s when he was controller of the currency, how the owner of a small bank which had failed out in the plains appeared in Washington, got off the train with a suitcase, and in this suitcase were all his stock certificates, bonds, and his life insurance policy endorsed to the controller to help reduce the losses of, in his bank that he was so embarrassed that he had presided over. <laughs> but this, this whole question, I, I, just a way of saying, of trying to think um, uh, abstractly, somebody owns a bank, it's an individual or it's a company, why are there different rules? Anyway, we'll, we'll open the, the uh, for any other comments, because Wayne, uh, Wayne had I one. I just wanted one, one brief comment. A look at one of the benefits, however, that hasn't been mentioned about the bank holding company structure is, it allows the bank holding company to fail if the bank is strong. Lehman failed, its bank was solvent, and its bank was sold to another investor that wanted that because the bank was in good shape. There are several other examples of that where the holding company was in bad shape, but the bank itself was solid. And by having that holding company structure, you could have that separate process take place. Let me, let me add to this. There's another really bizarre feature about Dodd-Frank and holding companies. That was the elimination of trust preferred securities. So trust preferred securities were issued by the holding company. They, they could be treated like debt for tax purposes. So the holding company got tax advantage from debt and then they could downstream as equity into the bank. And lots of, lots of, lots of trust preferred securities were issued. And then when, when the 2008 crisis came along, uh, the banks, the regulators didn't allow the banks to pay sufficient dividends to the holding company, so the, the, the holding companies couldn't pay the dividends on trust preferred securities, and they went in arrears for five years. And after five years, they still didn't get enough money to pay them, so they went into bankruptcy. And there are hundreds of bank holding companies that went into bankruptcy, and the banks are still alive and solvent and functioning. And so trust preferred securities worked exactly as they were supposed to. They were beneficial to the safety and soundness of the banking system, and yet regulators came out after we said, we have to do away with this terrible, terrible, terrible uh, hybrid form of capital. It's just, it's just not, it's not really equity. It's not real equity. Well, it sure did work like equity, and it protected the banking system. It's a, it's a bizarre thing. And, and that weakened, it was a big reason why form of holding company is no longer, you know, a very interesting form to have. You don't get, you don't get that benefit anymore. So it, 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 
but, but covered by the mark-to-market accounting rules. That's what clobbered the trust preferred securities. Trust preferred securities. Because the market for them collapsed, so then they had to pretend that they were less valuable than they actually proved to be in the end. But, but it's, another, it's another example where a good a, a narrative and a story changes the law, mm-hmm. not, not the real economics yeah. of what happened. Uh, um, so it's a kind of bizarre outcome. All right, well, we have a maximum two minutes left, so, and there are four of you, so that's 30 seconds each. Uh, would you take up in 30 seconds or less, uh, if you were king, would you uh, uh, abolish the Bank Holding Company Act, or, or what are the main things you would do to it? 30 seconds, George. Well, I would repeal the act for the below SIPI level banks. It's redundant. It really adds no value. The only real beneficiary of the Holding Company Act at that level is the Federal Reserve. Um, if it were to stay in place, I would uh, advocate uh, modifying the exemption for the industrial banks and take away the limitations that say they can only be formed in Utah and Nevada. They've proven their mettle. There's no reason why the OCC shouldn't be able to uh, charter banks of that kind when they put forth a, a safe and sound business plan. Uh, I would immediately repeal the Volcker Rule. The Volcker Rule is, uh, its primary effect is to block access to capital for medium-sized holding companies or banks. They're going to institutional investors. If the investors come in, they're near the control threshold. All of a sudden, the institutional investors are under the Volcker Rule, and they just shy away. So it's been a bonanza for the larger banks where, you know, you could invest billions and not get close to the control threshold. But you move down the scale, and there's a real problem there. That's the complaint I'm hearing. Great. Thank you for that very precise answer. Wayne. I think it's the right question to ask, and I think it's very timely to ask. As I pointed out to begin with, this is a time of transition where questions that hadn't been asked really need to be considered and evaluated. I don't know that we know the answer to that yet because we need to ask it more and we need to get a lot more people providing information to it. In the end, it ought to be decided by does the Bank Holding Company Act facilitate the ability of banks to serve customers or does it get in the way? If it gets in the way, then it needs to be reformed or revised. If it facilitates, then there's value. Okay. Larry, All right, what would to, you do to the Bank Holding Company right, Act? Right. To build on what Wayne just said, it gets in the way because it prevents potentially worthwhile complementary activities that may not be appropriate for the bank because they're not examinable and supervisable, but could be appropriate for a related entity. You want to call it a bank holding company, you want to call it a giraffe, I don't care, but there needs to be something that identifies the nature of the relationship between the two Again, call it the Giraffe Holding Company Act rather than the Bank Holding, you know, but there needs to be something that, but what we have now, way too restrictive because it prevents worthwhile complementarities. Thank you. Paul? I agree with much of what's been said, and I'll just mention when I sent my $30 to Ancestry.com, they said there was no chance I was going to be king. (laughs) (laughs) Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming, and thanks to our excellent panel.